The House will come to order. Prayer by the chaplain. Let's pray. Our gracious and almighty God, we gather today to acknowledge your holy presence, power, and sovereign plan for the world and each of us. As creator and Lord of the universe, we honor you and say, blessed be your name in all the earth. The heavens declare the work of your hands, and as holy scripture informs us, your glory fills the earth. I now ask for your blessing to be evident in this room today, and personally thank you for your holy love and grace. On this day, we are reminded of your words and works through one of your Jewish prophets. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days. You would not believe if you were told. We acknowledge that your sovereign plan will not be thwarted, and therefore we pray for great humility to live in subjection to you and your ways. Glorious Lord, you have instructed us to let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, I pray for these individuals who are here, sacrificing and serving as our representatives. I ask that you would provide great wisdom to them as they discuss the issues of today, provide each honored representative great sensitivity to the needs of others around them, holding firmly to absolute, eternal truth established by you in heaven for the benefit and good of those who live in this wonderful state. I also request that you would help all of us remember your words, captured in ink by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament of the Bible. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor. May we all speak the truth in love and yet season our words with grace. I now humbly ask all these things in the name of Jesus, my Savior and Lord, and acknowledge that in him all things hold together. Amen. The chaplain for today is Reverend Roy Fruits from Rock Point Church in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance. The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. Quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. <clears throat> journal of the House, 90th session, 2018, 86th day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Wednesday, April 25th, 2018. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with and the journal will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Reports of standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business has been placed on each member's desk. A minority report has been filed on House File 3138. We will, we will act on all other committee reports first and then act on the report on House File 3138 later. If there is no objection, the reports with the exception of House File 3138 will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. We will now act on House File 3138. The clerk will report both the majority and the minority reports. Pursuant to our House rules, we must take action on the minority report first. Knobloch from the Committee on Ways and Means, to which was referred House File Number 3138, an act relating to human services, with the recommendation that when so amended, the bill be placed on the general register. Minority, re minority report, we the undersigned being minority of the Committee on Ways and Means, recommend that House File Number 3138 be amended as follows and be placed on the General Register. And the Minority Report is signed by Representative Murphy and Hornstein. And Hornstein. <clears throat> Murphy E. moves that the Minority Report on House File Number 3138 be substituted for the Majority Report and that the Minority Report be now adopted. Discussion on, a, uh, on the minority report, uh, the member from Ramsey, Representative Murphy E. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. That is my motion, and I'd like to begin by asking for a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, in most of my tenure here, I have served and happily served on the Health and Human Services Committee. And one of the reasons why I have been so happy to serve on that committee, because I believe it embodies uh, our belief in the potential of every person. Next Tuesday, we are going to hear the majority's proposal on health and human services. And today, I would like to substitute an alternative for your consideration, because I believe it embodies uh, the hopefulness that I believe for the people of Minnesota. And here is why. Minnesotans continue to express their genuine care for one another all across the state of Minnesota. And I believe that we each hope that our hard work, wherever we are, is going to result in the good life in Minnesota, our own prosperity, our own opportunity to support ourselves and our goals. And much of the work that we do in Health and Human Services is about helping people who are struggling at the bottom of the economic ladder work their way up that economic ladder. And I think that embraces Minnesotans' hopefulness for one another. And that's where I am concerned uh, with the bill that the majority is presenting on Health and Human Services, and there are just a few reasons why. For Minnesotans who are working their way up the economic ladder, when we decide that uh, the things that are necessary for their ability to succeed are no longer accessible for them because we put in place bureaucratic barriers that are costly for taxpayers and property taxpayers and for counties. When we put those barriers in place, we actually kick out from underneath Minnesotans who are working hard that opportunity to work their way up the ladder. When we take away food from people who are hungry, it's hard for them to work and support themselves. When we take, a care, take away health care from people who are sick, it is hard for them to work and support themselves. When we take away childcare for families who are trying to get to work and make sure their children, their children are cared for successfully and safely, we take away that opportunity 
to work their way up the economic ladder. And that's not good enough from my perspective for this body of people who I believe care genuinely about Minnesotans and their very success. And that is why I think this minority report for your consideration is a stronger path forward for the people of Minnesota. It is also the case that it is our responsibility in this committee and so therefore this body to look out for the vulnerable people in the state of Minnesota. And that includes people with disabilities, our children and our cherished elders. And I think the bill that the minority has brought forward falls short on that. And while I am grateful that we have done work together on the disability waiver, we are not looking out for home care workers who are caring for the disabled and elderly in their homes. We're leaving them behind. And that's not good enough. Not good enough for me, not good enough for this body, and not good enough for the people of Minnesota. And last, let me say this, we have been talking for years but not acting strongly enough on the issue of op opioids and the crisis that is really making life difficult for the people of Minnesota, people who are addicted and their families. And in our minority report, is that penny a pill proposal that should get the light of day on this floor and should get funded so we can actually put resources into tackling that issue that is hurting families and communities across the state. In this proposal is language to make sure women have access to contraception that is free of charge so they can guide their own economic future. In this proposal is a real step forward on child care. And especially in rural Minnesota, child care deserts are holding communities back in their inability to hire people and keep people in the workforce. And that's holding Minnesota's economy back. So my fellow members, I know it is a large bill. Uh, and you know, I'm asking you to consider it right now. And I am, because I think it's important that we together embrace the idea that Minnesotans care for one another. And we believe that their hard work should result in their ability to get up the economic ladder, and the proposal that the, minor, the majority is bringing forward undercuts their success and thus undercuts the future for the state of Minnesota. And so I'd ask for your vote on this. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask Representative Hornstein to yield. He will yield. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, and I just wanted to make sure, do we have a, a roll call on the minority report that's been There requested? is a roll call okay. on this vote. Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you very much. And Mr. Speaker and members, I um, wanted to just make a couple of brief comments uh, about the transportation bill that will be before us next week and ask you to support our uh, minority report on it. The issue with this bill isn't so much what's in it, and there's a few things in the minority report that we would like to remove but it's what's not in the bill that is troubling. And I just want to touch on a couple of those. First, we have uh, done good work in this body on the issue of MinLARS, bipartisanly. I'm glad that we have a uh, commission that's been set up. I am glad that we have started to uh, fund the program uh, in terms of some of its needs. But we have not quite turned the corner. Uh, while we have made progress in terms of new personnel, we have a fantastic new commissioner at Minute. Uh, there are still many, many barriers to uh, making sure that MinLARS can be successful for our state and for our uh, communities. And that is so essential in terms of a basic governmental service and function. So this legislation does not contain additional support for MinLARS. And there's a particular function that needs to be addressed, and that is the call center. The first area of contact between us and our constituents, if they're having problems, is the call center. We don't want our citizens waiting hours on the phone to get basic services. And so we fund MinLARS and we fund the call center in this minority report. Again, we've begun to turn the tide. We've begun to turn the corner with new folks at, Min at Minute. We need to provide the resources for them to succeed. And I'm glad to be a part of our um, special uh, committee that's going to oversee MinLARS. But we need resources, and we need them now. It's going to run out in summer. 
There's another uh, glaring omission from the uh, transportation bill, and that is no support for public transportation, either in greater Minnesota or the metro transit system. And this is especially important and timely because we have zeroed out uh, general fund money for metro transit beginning in 2019. So we restore some of that money, and again, this is for our local bus system and for metro mobility making sure that citizens can get from point A to point B who need this service and rely on it desperately. We've, renew, we've removed a couple of things. Uh, bipartisanly, over many years, transportation finance chairs do not like to earmark money. And we have a couple of earmarks from the Trunk Highway Fund that we're removing. Uh, a couple of years ago, there were many earmarks in both the Senate uh, DFL bill and the House Republican bill. Uh, and we generated a letter from Republican and Democratic past transportation finance chairs, people like Representative Bernie Leader, people like Re uh, uh, former transportation chair Mary Liz Holberg. Uh, we had uh, pretty much almost unanimity from the last uh, several transportation finance chairs that we should not be earmarking. We have earmarks in this bill. They should be removed. They're from the Trunk Highway Fund. If you want to do these studies, let's maybe fund them from the general fund. And so we've added a couple of new things. Uh, rail safety has been an ongoing issue. Again, we have agreement among the parties that this is important, but we don't address it in this bill. So. Two-person crews on freight trains is a safety issue. We've added that. We've also added additional rail inspectors. And finally, uh, Mr. Speaker and members, while this was not part of the omnibus bill process, our committee passed unanimously, as did the Transportation Policy and Regional Governance Committee, chaired by Representative Runbeck, have passed unanimously legislation that requires us to uh, take more uh, assertive steps on distracted driving to make sure that we uh, ban the use of handheld devices. Thank you, Representative Uglum, for introducing House File 1180. This also passed unanimously in the Public Safety uh, Committee. I would urge us, that bill is traveling separately, but it is a transportation issue. And I would urge us, as a body, to get this bill through the Ways and Means Committee, onto the floor. We have 50 co-sponsors. Members, I have never seen in my service uh, this type of support bipartisanly uh, for an initiative. I've never seen something like this pass unanimously uh, through these committees. And so I would urge us, again, while it's not in the report, this is timely. We have many families who have lost loved ones and uh, as a result of distracted driving. I thank everyone on both sides of the aisle uh, for supporting Representative Uglum and I in this effort. So let's get that done as well. And with that, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would um, uh, conclude my comments. The member from Ramsey, Representative Murphy E. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members, and thank you uh, for listening uh, and uh, for considering this. And I'm looking forward to a big green screen uh, when we take a vote on this, because I believe that you, like I, see the potential in every person. And our work together is to make sure that we're giving people the tools to get up that economic okay. ladder. And when we kick them out, when we take the rungs out, uh, when we don't dig in on tough issues like what's actually happening in our nursing homes and our assisted living facilities and looking out for our cherished elders, when we're not thinking about the lives of families across the state of Minnesota, and what actually makes it work for them when they don't have access to child care. When we're not willing to take those on and square them up and actually answer to what Minnesotans are asking us to do, then we're not rising to the place that I think we can be. And that's why I'm going to ask again for your support uh, for this proposal, for this minority report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Roseau, Representative Fabian, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to a point of personal privilege. State your point of personal privilege. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize uh, there's some students upstairs, and uh, six of the students happen to be from Lancaster, Minnesota. 
the class of 2024. There's other students up there as well. I'd just like to welcome them to the chamber and say thanks for making a seven-hour trip one way down to the Capitol. Enjoy your stay. Further discussion on adoption of the Minority Report. The member from Washington, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I'd like to uh, thank the Minority Party for their work in putting uh, this shot together. Uh, it's a lot of work and included a lot of the priorities from the committee. I do appreciate that from the Health and Human Services portion of this bill. Um, also included some of the minority priorities that I think we're probably going to hear more about in the months ahead. And um, I just want to alert members to a couple of things of um, why this uh, minority report falls short. And uh, the primary reason is, is, number one, that it's not paid for. And I understand it's very difficult to try to get this to balance out working in a very, very short period of time. Uh, but you'll notice that on page 310, the appropriations for DHS go from 20 million to 75 million, and on page 271, uh, 11 million to 18 million for the Department of Health. So the bill is out of balance and does not work from a fiscal standpoint. Totally understand trying to put something together that quickly, but this does not work from a funding standpoint. And as you know, when you put a finance bill on the floor, it's got a balance and it does not do that. Also, I'd under, uh, I really want to highlight the fact that one of our three priorities within Health and Human Services is to repay people who are working very, very hard at some of the lowest wage scales, uh, at the 7%. This does not do that. This does not take care of the 7% problem. This takes care of union members uh, in, uh, within the PCA on page 163. Uh, but that's it. And as many of you know, that is not why we're here. Uh, we're here to take care of uh, people who need some extra help and uh, not, uh, do not represent uh, that increase that's just going to a very, very narrow group that's obviously just meant to uh, take care of a union, uh, which I understand that's, that's part of the priorities for the minority, but uh, we're trying to take care of the folks uh, really needing some extra care. I want to talk about um, Minnesota Care for All, which is... Uh, will be a, a big priority in the months ahead. I think you'll hear a lot from that. I would welcome that debate across the state of Minnesota because if you talk to people across the state of Minnesota, they will tell you they are paying more and more, they're getting less and less if they're writing checks for their health insurance. They see other people paying less and less and getting more and more and it's not fair. You'll see small providers that are hanging on by their fingernails. This will cut the reimbursement to those folks by 50%. And you will see the doors of small hospitals in rural Minnesota close their doors because of this action. You will see subsidy, subsidy going for rich Minnesotans for health insurance under this proposal. It is a policy step backwards. Uh, that is something that is absolutely where we do not need to go to provide health insurance uh, for the, the state of Minnesota. And lastly, just in tone, I appreciate Representative Murphy moving this forward, but I've looked very, very closely at this Representative Murphy in the very short time, and it really has an odd combination to it. It's got the friendliness of an insurance company and the efficiency of a government bureau all wrapped into 310 pages. I can't support it today, Representative Murphy, but I appreciate the hard work. Further discussion on the Minority Report, the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, uh, and thank you, Representative Hornstein and the Minority for bringing this report forward uh, with some of your ideas. Uh, Representative Hornstein, I've had very little time to really digest every detail, but uh, you mentioned uh, something missing in, uh, in relation to MinLARS, and you're absolutely right, Representative Hornstein, there is something missing. And what's missing is an operational computer system that serves the needs of Minnesotans. We were promised 
that on rollout back on July 24th that this system would be up and running. It is now nine months later. In addition to the original 90 plus million dollars that was spent on the system, we've authorized another $10 million on top of that, and we still don't have an operational system. Uh, this is very frustrating. To me, it's a Minnesota government at its worst when we promise and can't deliver in anywhere near to a timely fashion. Uh, we will continue to work on the Minlars issue, but at this point in time, we need to understand that they can deliver. And what I hear from my constituents is don't give them another dime unless you know you're going to get something for your money. And we, if we get to that point before the end of session, perhaps we can do some more work with that. But right now, that is not what I'm convinced of. Uh, when it comes to transit, uh, we are not ignoring transit. Uh, we talked about this this morning in committee. You know, our transit system can't operate efficiently or effectively without good roads and bridges. Uh, you can't get the bus, you can't drive a bus uh, unless you have a street to drive it on. So uh, funding roads and bridges adequately will improve our transit system and its efficiency uh, by decreasing traffic uh, congestion and getting our buses and other transit issue uh, carriers where they need to go in a timely fashion. With that, uh, thank you, uh, Minority, and for your hard work, but I, I cannot support this bill at this time. The member from Blue Earth, Representative Considine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would just like to correct one little thing that Chair Dean mentioned in the minority report. Um, actually, it does have money in there for the PCAs and the home health aides across, across the board, uh, not just union. It is the bill that I introduced earlier um, that uh, equates to approximately 75 cents an hour, uh, $30 a week for people that are living um, at 40% of the poverty rate. The people that are taking care of our developmentally disabled are mentally ill and that are on food stamps to feed their own children. Thank you. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to just comment for the public that might be watching that might think what a disjointed, weird debate we're having here. We've got transportation interwoven with health and human services. People need to understand that's because the majority party has chosen to put those two omnibus bills together. And so the minority in bringing forward our vision of what should happen had to do the same, putting together transportation and health and human services. So people need to understand that I think right there is a problem. We should not be doing this. There's really no reason we can't move separate bills and have separate debates on these very important areas, which in themselves encompass a lot of different things. This is a process problem, that, yes, and I know most people aren't interested in process, but it is making it very difficult to have an understandable debate today. I just wanted to speak a little bit about the Minnesota CARE buy-in. We heard Chair Dean say a lot of things about this proposal. I understand the majority party wants to call it Minnesota Care for All. That's completely misleading. It's not for all. This is essentially a new insurance option that people would have the option of purchasing. It's a program right now that's available only to those who have economic, certain economic qualification and they are subsidized and pay a very reduced premium. It's a very good program, but the proposal is to allow people who don't need a subsidy, who are paying full freight, to have this as an option for insurance. So it is not for all, far from it. It's also important to respond to some of Chair Dean's comments because this bill did not get a hearing. So perhaps the majority wants to just make statements about it, what it is and what it isn't, but the reality is we didn't get a hearing. So to say that it will cut reimbursement by 50%, that's not a given at all. In fact, the, the dirty secret around here is that legislators don't actually know what the reimbursement for providers is. We don't know how much our public programs pay our providers. 
And the reason we don't know is that the HMOs who are contracted to deliver the service won't tell us. We've had this debate over and over on this House floor. And I know that on both sides of the aisle, that a lot of members are beginning to really understand this, that the way we do our public programs prevents the legislators from having any control over what prices are paid to our providers. So that's a problem right there. So how Representative Dean can claim that this will cut reimbursement by 50%, I, I really don't know. But what I would say is, to the majority party, you spend $800 million subsidizing insurance companies to try to bring down premiums without any promise that they would do anything for the consumer with that money. You did that. $800 million. And that money is going to run out, by the way, and then those people are going to be in the same situation. This is an option for Minnesotans to have one other option that they could choose to try to have a less expensive coverage that would have a better network of providers that would help a lot of people in rural Minnesota. That's where most Minnesota care recipients are. They're in rural Minnesota. A lot of them are farmers. They're small business people who can't afford other insurance. They're struggling to get their business off the ground. This is insurance that helps a lot of our constituents. And all the governor and we are asking is for an opportunity to have this heard so that Minnesotans can see and we can all decide whether this is an option that would help our constituents. And yet the majority party doesn't give it a hearing and then wants to make up the facts about it and tell people what it is. Well, it's, that's, that's just what that is, making up the facts because it hasn't had a hearing and it needs to have one. So members, this minority report is really a great piece of legislation. It contains a lot of things Minnesotans care about. It actually tries to do something about the cost of insurance for people who now really cannot afford insurance or don't have a decent network when they do have insurance. It really tries to do something about that. It tries to do something about the absence of childcare across the state. It tries to do something about the opioid epidemic. And very importantly, it tries to do something about elder abuse, which has been a big topic this session. And I know that the majority's bill also does some things with elder abuse. This goes further. This puts in the provisions that were worked on by AARP and the other consumer groups that they believe and we believe are important to protect our seniors both from abuse but also as consumers of these very expensive services, that this gives consumers more rights in that space. Very important for Minnesotans, and these are things that the majority has not done in their bill. So members, I urge you to support the minority report, and I would suggest to the majority party that before we start blasting an idea that maybe you should give it a hearing so you actually know what it is. And, you know, and the other piece of that, members, of course, you all understand that to, the way a bill gets put forward doesn't have to be the way it ends up. If we would hear a bill, we could work on it together. And if there are real objections from parts of the provider community or other things, we could work on it and get it to be something that would work better for Minnesotans. So, but not giving it a hearing just cuts off the possibility of that. So please consider voting in support of this minority report. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I move to lay the minority report on the table. Representative Pepin moves to lay the minority report on House File 3138 on the table. Mr. Speaker. That is, uh, Representative Hortman, this is a non-debatable motion for I a request to a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. It's a non-debatable motion. The clerk will take the roll on the motion Mr. to lay Speaker, House File. Mr. Speaker, before we take the roll, could you please explain the red and the green vote on this one? I certainly can. Uh, the motion is to lay House File 3138 on the table. A green vote will lay it on the table. A red vote will not. Am I correct Mr. on Speaker, that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I Clerk? request a call of the House. Representative Hortman requests a call of the House. Seeing 10 hands, the Clerk will take the roll.
The House is under call, members. Please vote.
Members, as a reminder, we are on a motion to table the minority report on House File 3138. That is a non-debatable motion. There is a roll call on, so we will have a recorded vote. A, as a reminder, a green vote is a motion to lay the bill, or excuse me, a green vote is a motion to lay the minority report on the table. A red vote is a vote not to lay it on the table and to proceed with discussion and a vote on the minority report. Is everyone clear? The clerk will take the roll on the motion to lay House File 3138 on the table. The House is under call, members. Please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 76 ayes and 46 nays, the motion prevails and the Minority Report on House File 3138 is laid on the table. The question recurs on the adoption of the Majority Report on House File number 3138. Hearing no objection, the motion prevails. Second reading of House Files. Mr. Speaker. Second reading, House File number 3138. Second reading. Second reading, House File number 4385. Second reading. Representative Pepin. I move that the call of the House be lifted. Representative Pepin moves that the call of the House be lifted. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House files 4465 through 4468. First reading, House files 4465 through 4468. Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate file, herewith transmitted. Senate file number 2629, and the message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Uh, message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate file, herewith transmitted. Senate file number 3525, and the message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. First reading of Senate files. First reading Senate file number 2629, an act relating to workforce development. New move that Senate file number 2629 and House file number 2937, now on the general register, we refer to the chief clerk for a comparison. Hearing no objection, so ordered. First reading Senate file number 3525, an act relating to local government. O'Driscoll moved that Senate file number 3525 and House file number 3395, now on the general register, be referred to the chief clerk for a comparison. 
Hearing no objection, so ordered. Announcements by the speaker. <clears throat> Announcement by the speaker. A message from the Senate has been received requesting concurrence by the House to amendments adopted by the Senate to the following House file. House file number 3755. The member from Hennepin, Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I move a recess to the call of the chair until approximately 1 p.m. The Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration will meet immediately following recess in room 120. And then Republican members, we will caucus immediately following rules in our caucus room. Thank you. Representative Hortman. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, DFL members, we will caucus immediately after the Rules Committee in our caucus room, room 107. Representative Pepin moves a recess to the call of the chair until approximately 1 p.m. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails, and the House stands in recess to the call of the chair until approximately 1 p.m.